The role that the Bible plays in my life is pretty expansive. Um, it is involved in everything I do pretty much. Uh, I teach the Bible for a living um, to junior and senior girls at Trinity High School. I am also currently in seminary, so I'm constantly studying scripture. Uh, it also informs the way that I live my life, just the values that I have. And still, even now at 34 years old, even though I am teaching the Bible for a living to uh, high schoolers to teenagers and I love it and I know a lot more than I did when I was their age, I still ha need and have people in my life um, to, who do that for me as well. I remember about 11 years ago she was a little frustrated and we started talking and I had gone through the same frustration and teaching and so um, ever since then I've just been able to say hey Megan you know you know what you're doing your gift in this area and then if she's ever um, struggling with the passage in the Bible or has some questions about a different point of view, um, we talk about it. I, I have just grown tremendously in my understanding and love for scripture um, because I have had someone like Jared to talk to about these things. So discipleship is really important to me because it was so important to my own spiritual growth that it's pretty much what I do for a living is mentorship and discipleship. Um, that's part of what I get to do as my job. And it's um, really amazing to see students fall in love with scripture and fall in love with Jesus and get to be used by God um, to have a hand in that. It's important to me to have Ms. Ryan around because she's very knowledgeable about the Bible and She's gone through a lot and she has a very strong faith in God. And so there's even one time where I was having a really tough time with my faith and I went and talked to Miss Ryan and she actually helped me realize that I truly wanted to get baptized and I wanted to pursue God and that is what I really wanted to do. We know that God is always going to be um, protecting his church and in using even young people uh, to bring new awareness. I mean, as culture changes and as years change, we need fresh eyes and new insight. And God is always moving and he's moving through people. And so we need to invest in people as, as God would want us to. Um, the Bible is hard and it is confusing. So we're always going to wrestle with some of those things. But we also can be encouraged that God is still speaking to us. And the more that we understand and can wrestle with those questions and even get um, even a little bit of answers, then we now can pass that on to the people in our lives. And I've just found such joy and fulfillment in being able to do that, um, not just as a part of my normal Christian life, which is amazing, but also as a part of my career. And um, that's just a huge blessing and I'm really thankful for that. That story is a beautiful picture of the reality that, our, that organic discipleship, growing naturally in our faith, isn't just about me and Jesus. That's part of the story. But as you saw there, you have Megan. Megan, who grew up at Shoreline Church. Megan, you'll recognize, sometimes plays keyboards here on the worship team as a volunteer, and sometimes will be over here singing as a volunteer. And then you saw one of the high school kids who goes to Trinity Christian High School, but also uh, who is part of Shoreline Church, is on our worship team at times. Uh, but, but here's the picture. Here's Megan, she's growing, in, she's growing in God's word. She's trying to understand the scriptures and grow in God's word. But, but God puts Jared in her life, and Jared is somebody who's a pastor and a teacher, and Jared has influenced Megan as she grows in her journey with Jesus, as she grows in the scriptures. That's that generational connection. But then Megan doesn't let it stop there. She reaches out and cares for these, these students, these young women that are part of Trinity Christian High School, but also young women that she knows. And so, so, so you have this connection, and hopefully then that next generation will pass on to the next and the next, and that's, that's the journey of organic discipleship is, is, is knowing that we're walking in community. And I hope that picture inspires you to ask the question, when it comes to my Bible engagement, uh, who's helping me grow? Who am I helping grow? And am I helping them help someone else grow? Because that's how the work of the church continues on through history. Uh, this book, the Bible, we talk about Bible engagement. It's the first of the seven markers of spiritual growth that we're going to be talking about. Each of the markers of spiritual growth, what we really try to do is we try to say, okay, how did Jesus, how did Jesus live out this aspect of spiritual growth? How did Jesus model it for us? Because here's the reality. We're becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. Other people might disciple you. You might disciple other people, help them grow. But we're not becoming disciples of another person. We're becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. 
So we look at Jesus and we say, when it comes to the Bible, how did Jesus understand the Bible, live the Bible? What did it mean in his life? And then how do, how do I grow to love the Bible and have it mean something in my life like it did to Jesus? And then how does knowing God's word propel me out into the world? So Bible engagement is our starting point. And, and this book, the Bible, is the best seller in human history by more than six times. Not even close. There, there are more copies of the Bible than any other book in the history of the world. The Bible is quoted more than any other book in the world. As a matter of fact, I might quote it a couple times in my sermon today. Right? I mean, the, the Bible is... is, is but here's the, here's the reality. Owning a Bible is not Bible engagement. You might say, well, we got a Bible in our home. We got three Bibles in our home. We got five, five, do I hear 10, 10, 15 Bibles, 15, 20 Bibles. It's like, we got, well, there's lots of Bibles out there, right? But owning a Bible, having a Bible sit in your home doesn't transform your life. It's letting the Bible take hold of our hearts and transform us. And so in these, in these coming weeks, we're going to think together and really grapple with what it means to grow spiritually. And it always begins, it always begins by looking to Jesus. And when Shoreline, when we work together with a team of people try, trying to really discern the biblical model for, you know, for spiritual growth, the first question was, is this, does this reflect in the life of Jesus? Because if a disciple is becoming like Jesus, then discipleship is doing the things that Jesus did. So, so here's the first uh, reality. That Jesus loved the spirit-breathed words of the Father. Jesus loved the scriptures. Now for Jesus, it was the Old Testament. It was the Old Testament. When Jesus, when Jesus entered human history, the New Testament came telling his life in the Gospels and beyond that in the establishment of the church. But for Jesus, he loved the Scriptures. They were part of his life. And for Jesus, it was, it was, the, it was the Old Testament. And, and can I tell you a, a, a pastoral pet peeve? Do you know that your pastor gets periodically peeved? Lots of P words there. Uh, and, and here's what it is. When people treat the Old Testament like it doesn't matter. Or when people treat the 39 books of the Old Testament, there's 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament, so together they make the 66 books that make up our Bible. But when people treat the Old Testament like, well, that's not as important, doesn't matter as much, that was the Bible of Jesus. That was Jesus' scriptures. And he loved, he loved the scriptures. And so what does it look like when you love something? You know, if you love a person, you spend time with them. If you love something, you talk about it. And for Jesus, the scriptures, were, he was just immersed in, in, in the written word and loved it and delighted in it. Let me ask you a question. What comes out of you when you are squeezed by life? When life squeezes you, and it does for all of us at different times, uh, a global pandemic, political unrest, lots of bad news, physical struggles, relational conflict. You know, when, when life gets tough and when life squeezes you, what comes out of you? For some people, when they get squeezed, it's anger, rage, bitterness. And it comes, I mean, it just, when life squeezes them, it's just, Wah! and, and it, they just, that's what comes out. For other people, you know, what, what comes out of you when life squeezes you? For other people, when they get squeezed, you know what comes out of them? Fear, anxiety. They start kind of pulling away from life. When time, times get tough for some people, that's, that's what the squeezing of life brings out of them. For some people, when they get squeezed, you know what comes out of their mouth? Profanity. <laughs> Quick squeeze, boop. Long, tense time, and just that. But for Jesus, when Jesus was squeezed, what came out of him was Scripture, was the words of Scripture. When Jesus hung on the cross, his wrists nailed to a wooden cross, his feet nailed to a cross, taking your sins and my sins on himself, knowing every wrong we had done, every sin we had committed, and the judgment of that sin coming on him. When Jesus hung on the cross, you cannot get more squeezed than that. When his friends all abandoned him and ran away, when the guards mocked him and made fun of him. I mean, Jesus squeezed in every level. When Jesus was squeezed, what came out of him? Listen to these words. From Psalm 22, written hundreds of years before Jesus was on the cross. These are the words written in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. 
You are the one, Israel, your people praise. When Jesus was squeezed, what came out of him was the word of God, the scriptures. On the cross when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people don't recognize what is he doing? What's on his mind? What's in his heart? It's, the, it's Psalm 22. It's the scriptures. And they become his cry, the cry of his heart. When we get squeezed, we should be so filled with scripture that it comes out of us. How did Jesus deal with temptation? He said, well, Jesus was never tempted. He was God. Well, if you say that, you misunderstand. Jesus was tempted. Being tempted isn't sin. Jesus never sinned. When we're tempted, that's not sin. It's when we give in to the temptation that sin comes in. And Jesus was tempted. In Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, there's a record of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. I'm going to read you that account from Matthew chapter 4. And I want you to notice, just listen to these words, and notice that how Jesus responds when the devil himself comes and is trying to tempt the Savior. I'll begin in verse 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights... He was hungry. The tempter came to him, came to Jesus and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He fights back from the book of Deuteronomy. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, the devil said, throw yourself down. And now watch this. Satan misuses a passage from the Bible. Satan says to Jesus, throw yourself down for it is written. This is Satan talking. And he quotes, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands. So you do not strike strike your foot against a stone. Satan says, go up on the highest point of the temple, the the, the seat of religious power and authority. Throw yourself down. And and Satan says, and the the Bible says that the angels will swoop down, whoosh, and catch you before you hit the ground and lift you. And wouldn't that be cool? You You want to announce your presence, man. Jump off the temple and have angels show up and save you, right? But how does Jesus respond? Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your God to the test. Also from the book of Deuteronomy. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, the enemy said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil ran for the hills. It is written, It is written. It is written. Where did Jesus go in those moments of temptation? He didn't just have worldly temptation. He has the devil himself trying to tempt him. To Scripture, to Scripture, to Scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy. He's like, I didn't know there was so much good stuff in the book of Deuteronomy. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. Breathed by the Spirit of the living God. And there's power in God's Word. In his moments of being squeezed and in pain, Scripture came out of Jesus. In his moments of temptation, he goes to the the Scriptures, to the Scriptures, to the Scriptures. This is Jesus, and he's our model. He's our example. Jesus was the embodiment of Scripture as he fulfilled prophecy and made reference to the Old Testament over and over. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies. Where would the Messiah be born? That's where Jesus was born. How would the Messiah enter Jerusalem? That's how he entered Jerusalem. How would the Messiah die? That's how he would die. Scripture after scripture after scripture. Prophecy from the Old Testament after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. It goes on and on and on. Jesus fulfilled it all. Jesus came to fulfill the scriptures. He came to teach the scriptures. He taught the scriptures. Oh, Jesus taught the scriptures again and again. All through his ministry. When Jesus would say something like this, you have heard that it was said. It's not story time. It's scripture time. When Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, he's almost always referring back to something from the Old Testament. When Jesus said, it is written, he's getting ready to quote scripture. Jesus loved the written word of God. And so if we are disciples, 
followers of Jesus. What do we do? We look at Jesus. We see how he lived his life. We see what he valued. We see what mattered to him. And Jesus had this deep love for the scriptures. If we're going to follow him and become like Jesus, if you're, if you're a Christian, to be growing as a disciple means to be growing and knowing and loving and living out the word of God. If you're not yet a Christian, and we always have many people online and on campus with us that don't yet know Jesus, if you're not yet a Christian, understand that when you put your faith in Jesus, God has given us his book to guide our lives, to direct us, to, to inspire us, to encourage us. And so Jesus loved the scriptures, no question about it. So let's look at us. Do I love the scriptures like Jesus did? Do I love the scriptures? Do I hunger for them? Now let me be very, very clear. Uh, as Christians, we don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus. We worship one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But it's this book that reveals Jesus to us. It's this book that guides our lives. We should love this book. We should want to spend time in this book. We should be talking about this book. People should, should, be, people should look and say, man, she just loves the word of God. If, if your kids or grandkids or a family member said, what's something you love? If, if somebody asked, asked, asked this, you know, this, this, this you know, what, what is something you love? Or better yet, if somebody came to a family member of yours and said, what do you love? Oh, they said, she loves vanilla ice cream. Oh, good. What else? Loves her family. Great. Some different things. But, but should we also hear this? Oh, she loves the word of God. And how do you know you love something? You spend time. If I tell you I love my wife, but I never spend time with her, you're going to start wondering if I really love her. If I tell you I love my wife and you watch how I treat her, you're going to be able to tell if I really love her. Do people look at you and say, oh, she loves the word. He loves the Bible. Is in your heart and on your lips and shaping your life. And, and one of the things I hope and pray that happens all through this series, but today particularly, is that we would say, I want to, God, I want to just say the simple prayer. Help me love your word more. Help me love it so much I want to spend time in it. Help me love it so much I want to follow what it says. Grow my love for your word. So there's three steps to Bible engagement. If you say, okay, I want to grow in this marker of spiritual growth. I want, I want to be more like Jesus. Here's three simple steps, easy to remember. If you're a note taker, you can write it down or just lock it in your mind. They all begin with the letter L. Here's your three steps. Step number one, love the Bible. Say, so I want to grow to love the scriptures. Listen to these words from Psalm 119, verse 97. The psalmist writes, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it. I think about it all day long. And in the book, in Psalm 119, there's all these different synonyms that are used for the scriptures. Your, your law, your precepts, your commands. It, it uses different terms, but it's talking about the teaching of scripture up to that point, all that came before in scripture. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. So just begin to pray, Lord, grow my love for your word. Let me, let me hunger for the truth of the scriptures in my own heart and my own life. Then here's the second step. Step one, love the Bible. Step two, learn from the Bible. Learn from the Bible. Don't just get the Bible in your brain, but get the Word of God in your heart and guiding your hands and your feet and your lifestyle. Live out what the Bible teaches. Love it first and then learn from the Bible. And so I want to challenge you. You say, you say well, how do, I, how do I learn from the Bible? Well, the first primary thing, it's not that complicated. Spend time in the Bible. Listening to the scriptures or reading the scriptures? Now, let me tell you something about people who like to listen to the Bible more than they like to read the Bible. If that's the case, you are in very good company because through most of the history of the world, most people, many people didn't read anyways, and the printing press didn't come around for a long time. People would hear the word of God when it was read to them in their homes or when it was quoted to them from people who knew the scriptures. People for centuries listened to the scriptures. It was recorded on scrolls, but it wasn't in every home. People didn't have multiple copies. People couldn't put a Bible app on their phone and pull up their Bible anywhere they were. It was a different world. People listened. So if you say, well, if you, so, so those of you that like to listen to the Bible, look at me real quick. If that's you, look at me. That counts. That's good. That's fine. So well, it doesn't really count unless I sit and study it. Now, there's something wonderful about sitting and studying the Bible, opening it and, and going, you know, but, but listening to it, getting in your mind, getting in your heart. But daily, open this book every single day. Turn on, you know, turn on your Bible app every single day and listen to the scriptures. And some of you might be saying, well, you know, I don't, my life is busy. You know, I don't really have time to squeeze in. I can't read the Bible every day. Just don't have time. Here's my encouragement to you. If that's the case, really look at your day. Really be honest. 
Do you spend any time on YouTube kind of poking around looking at stuff? Do you watch any, do you have any streaming service? Do you watch anything on Hulu or Netflix? Or do you watch anything? You say, well, not, no, not that much, maybe an hour or two or five a day, whatever. But, um, but I don't have time. It's like, well, just check your calendar. Look at your normal day. And, and if, you, if you listen to God's word or read God's word every single day, make it part of the rhythm of your life. Maybe, maybe you drive a lot. And you say, well, I'm always listening to talk radio or listen to news. Well, turn it off for half an hour and listen to the scriptures. You'll be amazed at how much of the Bible you can get through. You'll be saying, oh, man, I just listened to the whole book of John. I just listened. It's, 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 it's just, but you're filling your mind and your heart with the word of God. But make that time. Commit the time to, to, to daily read the Bible. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't have a Bible... We want to give you one. So at the, end of the, at the end of the service today, if you want, and these are actually beautiful, it looks like leather, but no, don't worry, no cows were killed uh, to get this leather. It's, it's a pleather, it's fake. But these, this is a beautiful Bible. This is the, the translation we hear is at Shoreline. I've had people come and say, I read the Bible, I don't understand it. They'll show me their Bible, and they'll say, well, my grandma gave me this, and it's like in the King's English. It's like in ancient these and thous. I don't know why I don't understand it. Well, first of all, you're 14, and it's Middle English, you know, maybe that's part of it. But this is, this is in, you know, it's a great translation in modern English. So if, if anybody wants this, you just go by the Connection Center. My wife will be there, and we'll give you one for free. If you're, if you're online, come by the church and pick one up. We'd love to give you one. If you want a Bible in Spanish, we have that also. And, but also, if you want to get a study Bible or something, we've got study Bibles also, and I'll talk about those at the end of the service. But, but open the Bible. Read it regularly. I had a great experience um, with, with, some, with some good friends. Uh, I, I'm not into fishing, really. I don't do a lot of fishing, but I go fishing once a year. I got a group of friends that goes fishing. I love being with those friends. I love, so once a year I go fishing. It's the only time I fish during the year, but I, I, I enjoy it. But part of the enjoyment is being with friends. Well, this last year, after many years of going on the same trip with a group of guys, one of the guys, uh, and we just live out our faith and talk about our faith through the years, and one of the guys on this last trip made a commitment to follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, we took him right down. We were on the ocean. We took him right down the ocean, and we baptized him right then. And then I got online and ordered on Amazon, ordered an NIV study Bible for him. He, he sent me notes. So by the time he got home, it was, already, it was, it was like there the next day or whatever. And a few months later, we came, he, came, he lives down in the L.A. area. He came up here to hang out with us, and we were just going to eat some fish and talk about life. But he'd been reading the Bible. Brand new Christian. And just his insight and what God was teaching him, just listening to him talk about what God was speaking to him through the Scriptures was glorious. And brand new as a follower of Jesus. Not a young guy. But this was all new, and just, just God just speaking to him through the word. You're not going to grow, you're not going to learn the Bible unless you read the Bible, unless you listen to it. So make that part of your life. So step one, love the Bible. Step two, learn from the Bible. And step three in Bible engagement is live the Bible. Let it transform you. Listen to these words from James 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen. Don't just listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what, live it out. Let the Bible shape who you are, how you think. And so don't just listen to the Bible. Live the Bible. Follow what it says. Let it transform your life. Now, we have to have what, what I call the balance of information and transformation. To, you, to be transformed, you have to have the information. You have to read the text, the content of the Bible. So as you do that, you get the information, what it teaches you. But then the information leads to transformation if you let it. If you're reading the scriptures and the Bible points out something in your life that you're doing wrong, you're living the wrong way, then change your life to adjust to what the Bible teaches. The Bible talks about forgiving, and you say, boy, and all of a sudden God puts on your heart something you haven't forgiven. So I've got to decide now. Am I just going to love the Bible and just learn from the Bible, or am I going to live it? Am I going to struggle with that challenge of actually forgiving? Am I going to strive to become like Jesus in every area of my life? And, and, and so watch the balance of information and transformation. As you, as you, read, as you read this book, um, that information that it teaches you, it will, it will transform you. It will bring you joy. It will have you address issues like anger in your life. When you read the Bible and you realize that's not how I'm supposed to be living. And God transformed me. It will lead you to serving others. Why? Because the Bible teaches you to serve. And so you say, okay, now I'm going to live differently. It will move you to a place of generosity. Where you, under, you see God's generosity to you and, and his call on your life, it'll teach you to do crazy things like love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you might read those things and go, whoa, wait a minute. So I, I have things, now I've been a pastor a long time. I have times I read the Bible. And this morning, this morning I'm, re, I'm reading in the book of Exodus right now. And this morning, before services, just this morning, I was opening the scriptures, not for you, not for preaching, just for me to hear from Jesus. And I came across one thing in Exodus where I put a little question mark in the margin of my Bible. Because I, I, I hit a part where it's like, 
I don't totally get that. I don't, that and I gotta pray, I gotta think on that more, I gotta pray on that more, I gotta study a little bit more. It doesn't always, even as a pastor, everything doesn't always make perfect sense to me in the Bible. But I'll tell you what, there's so many things that do make perfect sense that want to call me to be changed. I'm following those things, and sometimes I put a little question mark, and I go back to it, grapple with it, think about it, and, and keep asking God, teach me, help me understand. There's two great theological words. I share this periodically at Shoreline because it's f- foundational to how we understand the Bible. So here's two great theological words, exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis, you might be able to even look at the word and realize we get words like exit and exhale from that root word. Exegesis is, is, is and, and that's sort of, sort of what comes out of it. Here's exegesis. You, let the, you read the Bible, you let it speak, and you let the truth and the lessons come out of the Bible, now watch this, out of the Bible, and transform your life. God, and so all of a sudden, you read something in the Bible and it doesn't align with your life. Oh, I have to adjust my life to align with the Bible. That's exegesis. When we, we're not looking at telling the Bible what to say. We're saying, what God, what do you say, and how do I align with it? Here's eisegesis. Eisegesis is taking my opinions, my perspective, and my worldview and imposing on the Bible. Don't do that. That's where we say, well, I'm kind of living this way, and I know it's not really what God wants, but when I read in the Bible that questions how I'm living, I try to change the Bible or ignore those things or justify them away because that makes me feel uncomfortable. Here's the beauty of, of the, this, this, the word of God in this world we live in. The word of God doesn't change. So when the world keeps changing, truth doesn't change. Truth is the truth, and God is truth. So I look and I say, God, let your word shape me. Don't let me try to shape your word. Is that what you follow? Exegesis, your word breathes out. Come, the truth comes out of the word and changes me. I said, Jesus, don't do this as I impose what I want on the Bible. And here's the thing. We're very clever we can take a few, verse from here, a verse from there, portion of a passage from here, shake it up together, put it out, and we, you can manipulate the Bible, try to make it whatever you want it to say. You can do that with any, it's, it's words. But when you say, God, I will follow what you say, I'm not going manip- to manipulate the Bible to fit what I want, I'm going to let the Bible transform me. That's what God wants for. Transformation, exegesis, eisegesis. And then locking scripture in your heart. There's something to just, to just reading the word, to, to, to meditate on God's word. To meditate on God's word is just to read a passage again and again and again till it sort of fills your heart, till the truth comes alive in your mind. So, so, and the Bible talks about, you know, the, the Bible will say meditating on the word, thinking about it, pondering the truth, grappling with it, reading it again and again and again. I encourage you to do that. And then also memorizing certain passages where you say, I'm gonna memorize a passage from the Bible. And let it become part of my heart and part of my mind. I'm just going to let it get in. I'm going to keep going over it and over it until with intentionally memorizing those words. When I was in college, I was a fairly new believer. I lived in a very secular area down in Orange County. I was going to Orange Coast College. And there were just temptations all over the place. and all. It, just, it was a challenging time for me as a fairly new believer, not having not grown up in the church. And so I decided I was going to start memorizing. I was reading First Peter. So I said, well, I'm going to start memorizing First Peter. You know, I was, had so many struggles and so many places my mind was wandering and things I didn't want to be thinking about. But I thought every time my mind wanders where it shouldn't be, I'll just go back and I'll keep working on memorizing First Peter. By the time about when the year was done, I'd memorize all five chapters. Now, I couldn't give it to you verbatim right now today, but I, but I could give you a lot of it. But here's the thing. It's all inside of me. I spent a year just going over and over and over and over so that when my mind would wander, I would just let Scripture fill my mind. There's something powerful about, about learning God's word and even memorizing it. Bible memory is not just for little kids, for Sunday school and stars on a board kind of a thing. It's for all of us. So look at your life and say, how can I let God's word get in my heart and get in my mind? And so Jesus loved the spirit-breathed word of God, the scriptures. We, as his followers, as disciples, we should grow to love and learn from and live the word of God in our lives day by day by day, making it the rhythm in our life. And when that happens, God's word begins to change us and fills us, and then we go out into the world and we have something to share because we, we live and speak out of the truth of God's word. And, and the, more, the, more we, the more the Bible fills us, the more we go with Jesus to share his truth and his goodness and his good news with the world. So I want to talk about how going deeper into the Bible should take us deeper into the world. I believe the deeper we get into this book, the more we're going to have a heart for the world. And I talk to people who say, oh, I read my Bible every day. And I'm like in four Bible studies. And I study, 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 study. I say, but, but they don't have a heart for the lost. They don't have a heart for the broken. They're not going with Jesus on his mission. 
And I actually, in my mind, I think, well, then do you really, do you really understand what the word is saying? Because when you read the scriptures and when they get inside of you, God's truth and God's mission and God's heart start to fill you. And then you look at people who don't yet know Jesus and you long for them to know Jesus. Why? Because his heart is coming alive in you. Because you're feeding on his word and seeing the heart of God and the mission of Jesus. Does reading the Bible, does knowing the scriptures really help us share God's love with the world? Well, I believe it does. So here's, here's one reality. The world is, look, is longing for good news. Right now, people in our world are looking for any good news. The world is longing for good news. And the Bible brings the best news in history. Our world is filled with people that are looking for any good news. And this book, this book contains, it's, it, the message of Jesus is called the good news. But this book has so much good news. Here's just at a, a quick overview of a few things. You read this book. So, so if you're a Christian, read this book. If you're not yet a Christian, I want to tell you this. If you put your faith in Jesus and start reading this book, you're going to learn some things that will change your life. Here's one thing that the Bible teaches you. You are loved by God. You're loved by God. The Bible actually says that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. He loves us so much, he came to us at our worst moment. He said, I love you right there. This, this book will teach you that. That God is near God did not, did not kind of create the world, put it on his axis, give it a nice spin and say, have a great eternity, I'm out of here. I mean, God says, I'm in this world. I come with you. He's Emmanuel, God with us. His spirit dwells in us. You read this book and you realize, God is with me. I'm never alone. God is near. You read this book and you find that you have purpose and meaning in life. That God has a plan for you and a mission for your life. And, it, and it's better than anything you could imagine. You learn that in this book. You're going to learn that God is Savior. He came to seek and save lost people. You read this book and you find out you're part of God's family. That God has a family, a forever family. And when you become a Christian, you're part of that family. This book teaches you that. That God wants to give you guidance and direct and lead your life. That you can have joy and goodness in painful times. This book teaches you that. That you can still walk in joy even in the worst of times. That God is preparing a place for you so that you can be with him forever. That's what, this, and that's, that's like the tip of the iceberg. There is so much other good news that when you really read the Bible, there's just so much good news that we need. And so the, the Bible inspires us to share his good news with a world that's looking for any kind of good news. The Bible gives us a mission, and it's God's mission. The Bible actually shows us, here's my mission for you. Listen to these words. From Mark 10, 45. This is kind of Jesus' mission statement. And whenever Jesus in the New Testament, whenever Jesus says the Son of Man, that was the term he used for himself. If he says the Son of Man, anything, he's talking about himself. So Jesus says these words, Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I came to lay my life down. I came to give myself for you. And the Bible calls us to that mission, to go and lay our lives down for people far from Jesus and to share his love and his grace with them. The scripture reveals the heart and the love of God. If you want to know the heart of God, you want to know the love of God, you, you come to this book. You read this book because it teaches you. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Listen to this not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Who does God want to see come home to him? Every human being. He sent Jesus, whose death was enough to pay for the sins of anyone who would believe. Now, God doesn't force us to come to him. God doesn't drag us into his kingdom, kicking and screaming. He invites us. But he loves us so much, he gave his life for all who would put their faith in him. And then following the teaching of the Bible, will make us shine like a light in a dark world. If you, if you love the word, if you learn the word, and then if you live the word, you begin to shine. And Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He didn't ask, do you want to be the light of the world? If you're a Christian, he says, you're the light of the world. And when you read this book, it changes you. So you, you hear Jesus call you to love and to serve people. And you start serving other people like Jesus. That shows the world that God's alive. It opens up the door for you to tell. People say, why do you care? Why do you serve? Why when everybody else is walking out saying, not me, do you say, hey, can I help? It's because you met Jesus who served you. It opens the door for you to share about Jesus. 
When you read this book, forgiving those who've wronged us. When people wrong you and you forgive them in a world that is radically unforgiving. I mean, in, the, in our day and age, someone can be caught for tweeting something nine years ago when they were, you know, 14 and, and now, they're, now they're 23 and they can be just tried and executed in the public courts for some dumb thing they said, one sentence they said nine years ago. Our world is not a really forgiving world. Anybody catch on to that? <laughs> and yet you, as you read this book and see the heart of Jesus and the love of God and know how he forgave you, you start to forgive people. That opens up the door to talk about Jesus because it's like, why? Why would you not hate that person and do all you could to destroy them? Why would you forgive? And you live with a changed life because of this word and then somebody asks you to say, because I've been forgiven wrong, every wrong I've ever done. I can't not forgive. That's a conversation starter right there. That opens up the door for the gospel. Overflowing with joy, even in hard times. When you understand the joy of the Lord, when you know that the joy of the Lord is your strength, even in hard times, and you live in that joy, that opens up spiritual conversations. When you express peace in the turmoil of life, in this crazy time of turmoil, when you walk and live with some peace inside of you, people are like, what's going on? Why? How do you live with peace? How do you have such confidence? And you say, well, it's not that... I don't see what's going on in the world because it's challenging. But I know who I am. I know who I belong to. I know where my home is. And your peace shows a confidence in Jesus that opens up the door to share his love with others. Wisdom from above draws people below. When you live with heavenly wisdom in your mind and your heart, and you share it. I remember one time a, a neighbor of ours, uh, came when, we, our, when our boys were little, came to Sherry and she said, I don't know how to, I'm watching how you kind of raise your kids and what you're doing with your boys. And, and she wanted to learn from Sherry some parenting skills. And Sherry basically said, well, I got to tell you, I, I wouldn't know what to do either, but I get all my ideas for parenting from the Bible. And Sherry began to share God's word with this woman because she wanted to know how to, how to parent better. And Sherry said, you're not, I, I'm, I'm just following what God teaches. And it opened up the door for a spiritual conversation. When you live in this book, when, 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 when you love it, when you learn from it, when you live in it, it begins to change your life. And then as you walk in the world, that opens the door to shine the light of Jesus. See, our Bible engagement isn't just me alone. It's locking hands with others. Our Bible, engage, our Bible engagement isn't just for me, but it's also for the world because it changes our hearts. It changes our lives. It makes us who Jesus wants us to be. So final question. What's my next step in Bible engagement? You know, what, what can I do next? What should I step into next? My greatest encouragement to you is just start reading the Bible every day or listening to it every day. If you don't know where to start, on the Shoreline app, and I checked it this morning. It's on the app. I actually went through it. I opened the Shoreline app. I went to the Bible reading, clicked on it. I went to today, Sunday, and today is, the, is Mark chapter 1. And I could open it up on my phone, and I could read it, or I could hit the little speaker, and it could read it to me. I went on my computer to check the Shoreline website to make sure it was all working. And I clicked through it. It took me about 14 seconds. And there it was, today's Bible reading. We actually, 365 days a year, pick a Bible passage for each of you to read. If you want to, it'll get you ready for next Sunday's sermon. So if you started reading today and you did, you did it every day for this week, you'd come into next week's sermon like all ready to go because you've been reading Bible passages that get you ready. Why, why, why would we take all the time to do that, put it on the website? Because opening God's word is so important and having a way to do it. If you have your own Bible study to do, that's great. But I would encourage you, if you don't, just start by each day listening to or reading the Bible and asking God to speak to you. And before you, before you read or listen, just say, Spirit of God, I open my heart. I'm not coming to judge your word and say what you should say. I'm coming to learn from you so I can change to be more like Jesus. And do that each day. It will, it will transform your life. Dare to let one other person come alongside of you and keep you accountable. I'll give you a challenge. You say, I kind of I fall off the track. I, I want to read my Bible, but I kind of get distracted. Pick somebody and say, hey, listen, for the, for the rest of the Organic Disciples series, for the next seven weeks, can we commit to read the Bible? Let's try to read it every day or five days a week or six, seven, six days a week and then say, and then let's check in with each other and say, hey, what are you reading and what did you learn? It's not, you know, what, what's something you learned from what you read in the Bible? And just have a little conversation. You do that every day. You, if you're married, do that with your spouse. Oh, that'd be, uh, you know, might be a good thing. You know, do it with one of your kids. Do it with another Christian friend. And you see after doing that for the next seven weeks, if that doesn't just become part of your life and letting God fill you with his word. And then jump into a group. Jump into a group where you can learn the Bible in community with other people, with a group of people. So, so we, have, we have men's Bible studies. We have women's Bible studies at Shoreline. We have precept on precept starting this Tuesday, on Tuesday evenings. We've got Wednesday night classes that dig into God's word online and on campus. And so if you're like, I want to I jump into a group, 
go on the website, see what we have there, or go to the Connection Center. Or out in the courtyard today, there's one of our booths, one of those, those tents out there that's just about all our different Bible studies. And go say, I want to learn more about some of the Bible studies. But again, I can't, I can't make it, I can't come to your house every day and say, time to read your Bible. Shall we? I can't, you know, that's, that's you, that's you. Making that decision, I want to grow up in my faith. I want to go deeper into God's word. And so Jesus, our Savior, if you say, I want to look at Jesus, what did Jesus, what marked his life? Man, the scriptures were just full in his heart. When he was squeezed, it was scripture that came out. Jesus loved the word of God, loved the scriptures. Okay, then we need to learn to love the scriptures and, and regularly partake of them, you know, di- in, ingest them, let them fill our souls. And then as they change us and we walk out of the world, we're different people. And we shine the light of Jesus because we're being filled up with his truth. And so Jesus, this is our prayer. Fill us up with your truth. In this world with so many lies and so much confusion, in this world where people talk about my truth versus the truth, let us come to you and feast on your word. Bring your truth truth into our souls, change our lives, and shine your light through us because we're being filled up with the truth of your word. Jesus, we pray that you would transform us by your, by your scriptures, by the word, and that we would take that time to listen to or read your word, and then you, Lord, will speak to our hearts and make us who you want us to be. We pray this in your name. Amen. Before I send you off and online, stick with me for just a minute. A couple quick things before I, I want to give you a word of blessing. Before I do, a couple things. If you need prayer, if you're online, just email to the address there or call the number you see there for prayer in the worship center anywhere on campus. Come up to the front of the worship center. We have teams ready to pray for you. If you're new, we want to give you a personal welcome. If you're online, just text the word welcome and we will, uh, we will get back to you. If you're on campus, go by the Connection Center and they want to connect with you and answer your questions and give you, and give you a little gift and welcome you here. Um, jump into one of the Bible engagement opportunities. Again, go by the Connection Center or the booth and ask about Bible studies, precept about precept, classes that we have here at Shoreline. Uh, If you want to get a copy of Organic Disciples, and this is the book we're walking through uh, as as a congregation, you can get this at the Connection Center. If you can't afford it, just take one. If you can afford it, pay for it. If you got extra, pay for two or three so that people that can't, and we'll all get one of these and walk through it together. And also, if you want one of these Bibles, Connection Center, and Sherry will be over there if you head over there, honey. And then Sherry's my wife. That's why I'm calling her honey in case you're new. Um, I don't honey anybody except for my wife in terms of my language. Um, but, but uh, And if you're online and you want one of these Bibles, just come by the office and we'll have them available. Just come by during the week and we'd love to give you a Bible also. And, uh, and then uh, we also are doing a podcast every week of this series that goes into a deeper conversation of all these topics. And so if you go on any podcast server and put in Shoreline Conversations or go on our website, you can find the link and you can listen to or watch the podcast. We actually film it and also you can do it you know, just listening or also watching as well. So lots of ways to keep growing. Take that next step. I want to invite you, if you're able to, wherever you are, online or here, just stand up and let me send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time together, may you look to Jesus and see his amazing love for the scriptures. May you grow to love the word of God and learn from the word of God and live the word of God. And as you do, may you be so filled with God's truth and so transformed into his character that as you walk into the world, you'll be exactly what Jesus says you are if you're a Christian. You will be the light of the world. God bless you. Have a great week. And we're back next week to look at passionate prayer and how that transforms our lives in the world. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.